Ginger, Tricia Stewart. I have foreign policy guru Scott Horton. He's the author of Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, uh, Managing Director of the Libertarian Institute, amazing, and the Editorial Director of Antiwar.com. So I want to give a big shout out, hello, and thank you to Mr. Scott Horton. Thank you very much oh. for having me. Very nice intro. Appreciate that. Aw. Uh, um, so what I wanted to talk about tonight, um, I've had a lot of messages. I get a lot of questions, and I am in no way, shape, or form a foreign policy expert. A lot of what I know is what I have learned through the Libertarian Institute, and we were talking before the show. Um, I just love the content you guys put out, uh, the links to articles, um, and then, like I said, Kyle Anzalone is a big fan of, uh, I'm a big fan of his because um, he puts out foreign policy focus, which is a really cool, like, just a way to keep up on what's going on. So I want to talk about Yemen. So. For those people that are unfamiliar with what's happening there, and we could maybe go back to the 1920s. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want to. I'm game. But um, if you could give a narrative of an overview of the players and the acts of what's going on there, where would you start? Um, well, I guess I'd start, first of all, with just the current day so that people understand why we're even talking mm -hmm. about this. What's important is this is absolutely the worst thing that the U.S. government is doing right now. And that's really saying something because it's a very busy government. Um, but it is literally a starvation campaign, a deliberate campaign of genocide, a medieval style siege against the poorest country in the Middle East, against the most helpless people, uh, the tiniest, weakest little nation. It's like Somalia across the Red Sea there. And the most powerful nation in the history of the world is waging a full scale war against people who never attacked us, never did anything to us whatsoever. I'd also say, and we'll get back to this part of it, but um, the reality is that um, this is not under the authorization to use military force to attack Al-Qaeda after September 11th, which has been used to justify wars against Al-Shabaab and all different kinds of things. It's actually not the war against Al-Qaeda at all. This is the war for Al-Qaeda against their very worst enemies, the Shiite Houthis from the north of the country that took over the capital back in 2014 and 15. And so, as Michael Horton, no relation to me, a real Middle East foreign policy expert, said back then at the start of this war four years ago, that we are flying as Al-Qaeda's air force in this war mm -hmm. against the Houthis. And they had actually just a few months before, as of January 2015, CENTCOM was passing intelligence to the Houthis to use to target and kill Al-Qaeda guys. And just two months later, Obama has some switch sides in the war to Al-Qaeda's side. And of course, the reason for that is because of a bunch of trumped up hype about Iran and their support for the Houthis. And Israel and Saudi Arabia, and therefore Washington DC would have it, that you hate Iran and their allies more than Al-Qaeda, the guys who actually attacked the United States of America and killed thousands of civilians in 2001, as well as were the worst part of the Sunni-based insurgency in Iraq War II that killed 4,000 out of the 4,500 Americans that died in that war. And so it's treason, and it's genocide. Mm -hmm. It's as bad as Iraq War II, at least. And then, and I would say so, almost sorry, worse. I would say almost worse. It's. Do you think it's a proxy war? Yeah, it is. It's all in the name of containing mm -hmm. Iran, which is actually, yeah. you know, really garbage. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I say to your director real quick? Can you, you just can leave it on the double screen? Mm -hmm. Um, because. Um, yeah, that way I can look at her instead of myself. It messes me up when it switches back and forth. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you're better for looking at than me. Um, so, um, no, I won't go back to the 20s, but I will go back to Obama. Okay, so Obama comes in 2009. Now, Bush had done, I think, just one drone strike, possibly two drone strikes against Al-Qaeda in Yemen. In one case, he actually killed an American, but it was the kind of thing mm -hmm. where like, hey, what was he doing with Scott, them? I don't could think you Bush give us, knew. could you give us a little bit of background on that story? Because... As I talk to people being activists, they're not they're unfamiliar with that story. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So here I'll go back to the 1990s for a minute here. So, you know, go Bin ahead. Laden, actually, his family comes from uh, Yemen going back a couple of generations. Mm -hmm. And there was 
you know, Yemenis were some of the, a couple of the hijackers were Yemenis, including the, I think both of the flight 77 hijackers, certainly one of the flight 77 mm-hmm. hijackers was Yemeni. And, um, famously they had what was called the switchboard house there in Aden in South Yemen, where they as, like were the operators who took the calls from Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and transmitted their messages to other Al Qaeda guys around the world, including the nine 11 hijackers inside the United States. Um, and this was the group that had done the USS coal bombing in October of the year 2000, which killed 19, I think 17 or 19 sailors and almost sank the <laughs> USS coal, but did not succeed in sinking it. And then, um, you know, since that time, this is the same group that in 2009 tried to blow up the plane with the underpants bomb over Detroit on Christmas Day, 2009. Remember that? Um, and then there oh, yes. was the printer package plot like and a couple other plots to blow up planes uh, since then. They also helped to, um, in more recent times, help to organize uh, different attacks in France, including the Charlie Hebdo attack and I believe the attack on the mm-hmm. concert goers. Uh, I think a year later, 2015. Um, so that's Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. They were a problem. They were part of the original real Al Qaeda back in the time leading up to September 11th. And it was really a small group, but you know, it was never meant to be a mass movement. It was a, basically a very select group of people who were involved in it. And so they were, you know, essentially effective terrorists. So in 2004, I believe it was actually, no, it might have been 02. George Bush used a drone to bomb a car in Yemen that killed some Al-Qaeda guys. And they were Al-Qaeda guys. And there was an American with them. And then his friends ended up being the Lackawanna Six who were arrested in Buffalo, New York. And this is the one where Dick Cheney wanted to send the U.S. Army to declare martial law and go and arrest them. And Bush said, no, 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 and just sent the FBI and got them the Lackawanna Six. And they were, there was really trumped up charges. Like they knew a guy who was in Al-Qaeda, but that didn't really make them a sleeper cell, but they portrayed it that way. But anyway, so there there really was an Al-Qaeda problem, a very limited one, but an Al-Qaeda problem in South Yemen before and after September 11th. Um, and by the way, uh, not to make apologies for Bush, but when he did that attack, as far as I understand, they had no idea there was an American with those guys. And I think the lawyers probably mm-hmm. would have called off the strike if they had known then that there was an American. Um, not that that stopped Obama so? later. Hmm. But, right. um, yeah, because I think at the end they were, oh, we didn't mean to kill an American. It was We were targeting the guy in the passenger seat. What well, is his fault for driving? You know, it was one of those um, <laughs> at the time. But anyway, the, the, the real game gets started because Bush actually – um, you know, I guess maybe I don't know the full extent of the Bush administration's Yemen policy after that, but I think that was it for the drone strikes. They did not have a drone war campaign. They may have had mm-hmm. special operations forces, uh, Joint Special Operations Command, especially hunting down and killing guys there um, to a limited degree. But the real terror war in Yemen ramped up under Obama at the very beginning mm-hmm. in 2009. In fact, you might remember when Obama announced the Afghan surge. At the end of the speech, he said, by the way, Yemen, Somalia, we're coming for you, too, which Bush had already started the Somalia war back in 06. But Obama Mm -hmm. Obama was then escalating both of them, which is important. This is in November. America, and you can check the records at antiwar.com, the USA had been bombing Yemen with drones beginning in October and through November and December in the time leading up to the underpants bomber. And then as soon as the underpants bomber tried to blow up the plane over Detroit on Christmas Day, they said, oh, no, I guess we better start having a war against Al Qaeda in Yemen now when (laughs) it was pretty obviously direct retaliation. And I should mention as a footnote here, because it's not really relevant to our story, but it's a little bit and it's just too important to leave out completely. And that is that Patrick Kennedy at the State Department admitted under oath that they knew this guy was a terrorist. His father had called the CIA and said, my son has fallen in with these Al Qaeda guys. He's, they're going to use, use him for an attack. He was from Nigeria. He was not Yemeni. So he had like an easier time with the passports and this kind of thing. His father called the CIA and warned him. They knew they didn't drop the ball. They knew And Patrick Kennedy admitted under oath. They let him get on the plane in the Netherlands Mm. to get, to fly to the United States of America. They had no idea he had a bomb on him. But they just wanted to follow him and see who he talked to in the United States, not realizing he and had a they bomb are in complicit. his underpants. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And so they, they could have gotten that, that plane blown up. 
And there was a lawyer at the time who I interviewed who said, hey, I saw some funny stuff where some spy or high level national police types were intervening to make sure this kid was allowed on the plane. And then this happened. So what the hell? And then Patrick Kennedy later confirmed that that was right. They decided to allow him on to follow him. They almost got that plane full of people killed. And then imagine if the plane had blown up over downtown Detroit on Christmas Day. Yeah. Uh, the you know, casualties funny, of the people on the ground and everything. It's funny you talk about that, Scott, because so many people have conspiracy theories. And I think many of those theories, like, uh, and what you're talking about is fact, but they think, oh, they did it, so something would happen. No, I think that they... They want to follow people and <laughs> haunt people so much that they're so inept at their job. <laughs> um, I, I, I really agree so with you in this case. That's amazing to me. <laughs> yeah. 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 I totally think you're right about uh, that in this case. You know, actually, Obama, there's a, a little Obama toady from NBC named Richard Wolf. And Obama actually had yeah, him go straight on MSNBC and say that, that Obama was concerned that the CIA had set him up and that they had done this on purpose to make him look like oh, he wow. wasn't doing a good job and this and that. And then like he didn't lay I, I in think bed that wasn't them. really right either. But yeah, it just goes to show mm -hmm. that Obama had the same kind of conspiracy theories about the CIA as the rest of us, that they would do something <laughs> like that. They would allow something yeah. like that to happen if they thought it served their interest to do it. And the president himself was worried that they had that they had done this in a way to set him up to betray him rather than just like you said, they thought they're clever, but they're really too clever by half, just as always, you know? Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that's, um, the, yeah, well, I do. I want to talk to, about that, too, because I, I'm going to keep the thread on Yemen. But this is I'm an informal um, interviewer. I'm not a fancy sure. pants. I just say whatever the hell I want to say. Um, and I want to go to that point of, you know, people think, oh, this is a conspiracy theory and, and whatnot. We're going to stay with the threat of Yemen in a little bit. But I think I find it very funny that like declassified information and just general knowledge is considered uh, some type of like weird um, off-putting whatever. I don't know. I think it's very strange that people think it's a conspiracy theory when it's right out in the open and it's facts. I think that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you would mention something like that to somebody that's unfamiliar with it and just follows the mainstream media, um, they would think that that's some ki type of strange conspiracy theory when it's right in front of us and it's, it's open information. Right. Well, Okay, so I mean, the thing about this is that people of all different political persuasions and including the center establishment media, they engage in all kinds of conspiracy theories all the time. And like to use that, I think it's okay in some circumstances to use that term as a pejorative, because what it, if you're using it really correctly, it means inductive logic right it means essentially being mm -hmm. willing to leap to conclusions and then stick there no matter what without enough evidence really so you you can paint a picture and say well maybe this is the explanation um but where deductive logic tries to disprove everything and falsify everything until only one explanation yes. is left essentially you can build a case for anything the the question is whether it can withstand real scrutiny. You know, that's what science and, and reason are all about is not just building cases, but tearing them down and seeing what can withstand that kind of assault. And so TV engages in, I mean, think of how insane the conspiracy theory is that Saddam was working with Osama bin Laden. This is total nonsense. Yes. So the conspiracy theory, even on the face of it, the conspiracy theory that the Trump campaign was deeply embedded with FSB right. agents and assets working on this whole plot to steal the election from Her Highness and all this stuff. It's total nonsense, <laughs> right? And you yeah. see the same kind of thinking on the fringes too, on the left and the right, where mm -hmm. You know, essentially everybody's a truth there, right? Essentially everybody likes believing what they believe and, and they don't like right. challenging their own beliefs and they like confirmation bias. And, you know, I'm that way too. Everybody's that way to a degree. Um, but as far as what you're talking about, where as long as something is not a narrative on TV news, it must not be real. That must be a conspiracy theory then. Exactly. I mean, when you can go a weakness. little bit deeper... You can go a little bit deeper and find it as open public information uh, that sure. boggles my mind that the media has such a narrative that 
we can, you know, somebody could say something, you think, oh, that's crazy, but you can really research it for like five hot minutes and figure out that right. it's truth. It's not. Well, look at the uh, neoconservatives, you, actually. Yeah. I mean, the, neo -con the neoconservatives in, in the run up to Iraq War II, the idea was the Republicans are doing this war. The right is doing this. And essentially, that wasn't really true. James Baker the Third, the Sith Lord and oh, lawyer God. for every oil company <laughs> in the world, and is the father secretary of state, did everything he could. He and Scowcroft both to stop Junior from doing that war. Colin Powell tried to tell him, this is really not what we're about here. Well, what was going on? What was going on was the axis of Bill Crystal had seized power in Washington, D.C. And you had, honestly, like no more than 75 men take power and probably 50 take power inside the government departments as assistant secretary of state for lying us into war and these kinds of positions and the rest of them were all in the media the wall street journal the washington post the new york times and then the rest of and the and the uh, pardon me of course the national review and the weekly standard <laughs> they had all right wing <laughs> on total lockdown and then they had AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. They had the Hudson Institute. They had the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, the Jewish Institute for National Security Affairs, the Center for Security Policy, and especially AEI was the, the real ringleaders of the whole thing, Crystal and Ladine and them. And so this was a very, very small sect within the American right wing. We are talking about Gertrude Himmelfarb's family, essentially, <laughs> are the ones who are the ones doing this. And the American people, if you were reading antiwar.com and you're reading Justin Romando and he was saying, listen, let me tell you all about Richard Pearl and why it's so important, this one man and, and his influence here. That sounded like some conspiracy crankery to someone who is reading yeah, the Washington Post. but it's Post. not. <laughs> yes. Right. Washington Post would never differentiate. They would just say, well, you know, Republicans, right? When it was really this very <laughs> weird sect of ex-communists who had become right-wingers and they're very close to the Likud party in Israel and very close to Northrop Grumman and especially Lockheed. And this is, you know, it's it's a Norman Podhoritz and William Crystal and their set of, again, far less than 100 men. And so that's the kind of thing where Again, if you went by NBC News, it would be a conspiracy theory. But if you just looked at PNAC.org, there was the entire PDF of rebuilding America's defenses. This is our plan for conquering the Middle East. It's all right there in black and white. There's no conspiracy theory about it at all. It was just omitted from meet the press. That's all. And, and I think that touches to such an important point, Scott. And we're digressing, but I'm gonna, we're going to do whatever we want to do because this is my show. Um, so the mainstream media holds the narrative in society and they are controlled by the political parties, the duopoly. Um, and it, it's, I find it so funny because we're talking about um, people thinking of conspiracy theories and stuff. And there's such a small amount of people um, that control the thought of most of the American people. Now I know um, because I follow you that you have kind of had an issue with uh, social media lately. Um, this is something that I, I have mastered is social media algorithms and stuff. Luckily, I haven't been shut down yet. I probably will be eventually. Um, and they, you know, they control the narrative of society. I want to know what happened with your social media accounts. I'm very interested in this and I'm digressing much from Yemen, but it's okay. We'll, we'll go back. Sure. It's actually, it's been five years now since I quit Facebook. And it's been, uh, wow. I guess, three quarters of a year or so since I quit Twitter. And the deal is, it's really stupid from a business standpoint. I mean, I'm an alternative mm -hmm. media person and I need these tools. But at the same time, screw them, man. I just don't have the time in my day to dedicate to this stuff. And, you know, Facebook, um, they just, they just, you know, in the first place, Facebook ruined everybody's blog. I had a great little community of human beings in my comments section at my blog stress. And when Facebook came out, MySpace didn't do it. But when Facebook came out, all that went away and, and all over the place, all over the web, everybody's comment section moved to their Facebook page. So it's like, all right, well, I guess I'm doing like half my media essentially right. I'm doing on this other guy's website rather than my own. Um, if I'm writing blog entries, nobody's reading them. If I'm writing Facebook posts, they are. Okay, well, I guess I got to go ahead and start hanging out. And then I cultivated, I had this great community of people on Facebook who would hang around my page all damn day and argue about everything. It was, 
not the same people from the comment section before, but others and what, and then they all just vanished and they all vanished because Facebook changed the algorithm. And mm -hmm. so no, my posts were no longer showing up in anybody's feed. So I would even interview Ron Paul and they would get two likes and one share. And the point yep. obviously was they just, they weren't showing it to anyone. So what I did was I thought, you know, I saw um, Adam Kokesh had like 50,000 likes and I only had like 6,000 followers. So I thought, you know, maybe that's what I need to do is I need to change my page from a personal page with followers to a business type page with likes instead. Oh, that's so a way I to get throttled. That. Yeah. And they had already changed the algorithms for that too. And mm -hmm. the only difference that made, they didn't show my post to any more people. The only difference that made was now it would say under the post, if you give us four bucks, we'll show this to somebody, mm -hmm. you know, or have it, but otherwise we won't. And it would even say like four people got this impression. I got 6,000 mm -hmm. followers who people who signed up to follow mm -hmm. my stuff. And they would even say, we show this to four people. You want to show it to 40 more? You give us $4. And I just canceled immediately. Yep. I just don't like people telling me what to do. And that was it. I just never went back again. And I've had helpers kind of post stuff up there for me and whatever a couple of times since then. And then they go away and I just can't be bothered to do to work for Zuckerberg for free and then have him screw me like that. I just, I don't care. And then, well, um, and that, that Scott, to that point, honestly, a lot of people, I really dislike the libertarian answer to this. Um, oh, it's a free, uh, you know, it's a private organization. No, no, they're in bed with the state. Number two, they're not, they don't have a business model because um, I have a great following and I have several pages. Um, they're not using that, uh, like you would if you had a business set up, they're using it in a political and divisive way. They're not working for their customers. That's not a business. That's not a free market right. enterprise. That's somebody that's in bed with the state and is shutting down free voices because free voices generally get followers. Like people are interested, honestly. Social media mm -hmm. in its inception was really wonderful for people that wanted a different voice, but they shut it down they're not they're not interested in making money they're interested in silencing people um so i find yeah. a little bit of i take issue with that because i do a lot of social media um marketing and that's where i have most of my following but i know so many friends um and then like you yourself you have so much important information and you've been silenced by them and it really bothers me that they have such a monopoly on uh reaching out and having a voice yeah. Well, and the same thing is true for Google, too, where they, you know, mm. quite openly bragged that they were deranking everybody who the Washington Post accused of being, you know, relaying Russian disinformation last year or two years ago. <laughs> which That's so is stupid. A lot of left wing <laughs> alternative media sites and a lot of libertarian alternative media sites really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, Ron Paul's Institute, Antiwar.com, the Anti Media, the Free Thought Project, mm -hmm. and all those guys. Mm -hmm. A lot of great libertarian sites got their ass completely handed to them by Google and by Facebook. And Facebook just did a, well, I guess last November, they did this massive purge and kicked all kinds of libertarians and activists and whatever uh, left. And, and I guess right-wing oh, sure. activists too. Um, and, you Some know, of those so are my Twitter very good too, friends. Yeah. And they lost, yeah. they lost their livelihood, not only, um, and they were paying Facebook. So Facebook broke their contract. You know, you're paying the site right. for ads and things like that. And then they well, shut you right. down. Honestly, that's a broken contract. Over. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, the national sure. government just took the thing over there. They couldn't let that thing go on where, oh, you know, no. for example, the, the, finally the outrage over police brutality in the middle part of this decade, it was Facebook. It wasn't just the killing of mm -hmm. Mike Brown. It was all kinds of regular non-political people everybody's mom was going man what is up with the cops these days holy yes. shit and, and what it was was it was because these are always a local news story usually the local press will cover them mm -hmm. you know if they're big enough but facebook and twitter make them into national news stories if the consumers want that. We don't have to wait for Rather yeah. Jennings and Brokaw to decide whether this local police abuse story is a national story. Right. We make it a national story. And so what mm -hmm. happened was people could see everybody's, you know, rich white mom sitting in her very comfortable house and neighborhood could look at Facebook and go, oh my God, apparently on the other side of town, my sheriff's department mm -hmm. is at war against these poor people. What the hell is going on here? And so... Yeah, they don't like that. And look at the war in Gaza oh, yeah. war. 
the slaughter against the Palestinians in Gaza in 2014, oh, yes. where, you know, you had, um, you know, the Israelis are sitting in yeah, beach lounge chairs on the hillside watching and hooting it up and drinking and having fun uh, in no danger whatsoever as the IDF is just slaughtering these people by the thousands. And what had happened was the Israelis had finally let the Gazans have 3G, uh, but they forgot to turn it off. And so the Palestinians <laughs> were taking pictures and putting it on Twitter and getting retweets. Mm -hmm. And this was the first time that American public opinion sided with the Palestinians and not the Israelis. Because instead of watching TV, people were looking at Facebook and Twitter and seeing the Palestinian side of the story for the first time. And then guess what? Yeah, reality favors the Palestinians. The mm -hmm. Israelis and, are the and, aggressors. The Palestinians are their victims. The, and so all you yes. have to do is just show people the truth of that for a minute. And then it, and so from the point of view of the State Department, from the FBI, from the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, what have you, they got to do something about this. You know, they got to go in the name of Russia, mm -hmm. in the name of whatever it is, they've got to clamp yes. down and figure out a way to prevent that from from going on. You know, Twitter, at the time I quit yeah. Facebook and switched to Twitter, Twitter would show you everything in chronological order. Simple as that. No algorithm. Mm -hmm. Great. And then they went and changed all that, too. And um, by the mm -hmm. way, the reason I quit Twitter was because I liked it too much. I was absolutely just wasting my entire <laughs> life on there. And I was actually it? thought, like, I could get hit by a truck and be dead. And then was somebody going to tell, like, oh, well, you know, he tweeted a lot. And uh, yeah, This is not. <laughs> I, I got another book to write. I got two or three more to edit. And I got work right. for anti-war.com to do. And I, I know I need it to promote my work. But I just... I, I had essentially like an abusive relationship with that thing where I had to just quit, quit or uh, quit Twitter cold Turkey, or um, I just Let's wasn't ever going to get anything done. So when you. they kicked me off, they kicked me off for like a week because this guy, Jonathan Katz got Peter Van Buren banned, like really banned from Twitter. Um, and so then I called Jonathan Katz a big bitch and then so then a feminist <laughs> went and said, oh, he used the B word. And so Twitter canceled my account for a week. And at the end, they said, oh, our mistake. Sorry. And, you know, never mind. They tried to. It was funny, too. Dan McAdams points out. They try to make you p push a blue button. It's straight like some crazy BF Skinner thing. They make you push this blue button, admitting that you were wrong and that what you did, like you have to do like the struggle session or whatever and concede that, you know, their point. So I don't like it when people tell me what to do. So I just didn't. And then like a week later, they let me on, but I just haven't been back since. I just quit at cold turkey. And I, and I am in the middle of writing another book and I just, I just can't do it. Oh, but, what is your book about? Wait, 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 Scott. Wait, what is your book about? Well, okay. So the Afghanistan book started out as a book about the whole terror war. But then chapter one mm -hmm. about Jimmy Carter through Bill Clinton was already way too long. And then chapter two about Afghanistan just got totally out of control. So I turned it into a book about Afghanistan. But okay. the original book was supposed to be Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Libya, Syria, Iraq War II, Iraq War III, Mali, and Niger, and the whole drone war and every bit of it. And so yeah. that's the book I'm working on. I'm trying to make it – I'm trying to split the difference between – you know, telling you everything you need to know, but not telling you any more than that so that you're not too bogged down. If I'm going to tell you about 10 wars. I got to make each one somewhat easy, but mm -hmm. I want to basically take people from Jimmy Carter through right now and say, this is why, obviously, just like with every problem in America, it's all our government's fault. Everything. The mm -hmm. U.S. government is the root of every social crisis we have, and that includes so-called jihadi terrorism uh, attacking us. Mm -hmm. Of course, Jimmy Carter started this. Of course, Ronald Reagan and George Bush made it worse, and Bill Clinton doubled down on that, and then George Bush ruined everything as though it wasn't already a disaster. So, And that ought to be easy, you know, especially for libertarians, when if Bear Stearns goes out of business— before we blame the CEO, we blame Alan Greenspan for building up a giant bubble. Okay? Well, it's true that Alan Greenspan deserves his blame. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about right, the right, Austrian right, theory yeah. of business cycle and whatever. Mm -hmm. But when, when it's a banker losing everything, we go, oh, what did government do to put him in this position? 
Well, that's how we need to approach all these questions when it comes, especially to the powerless as well. Why is this guy selling drugs for a living? It's well, so the CIA is flooding mm-hmm. the market with product, but the DEA is still keeping it all illegal and in the black market. And there's no industry because he shipped his job away and he's, you know, and the price is high Scott, because that's of a really the great point. Why do we blame the smallest man for his transgressions when the largest man takes no blame? It's a really funny problem in our society, especially as Americans. We blame right. the man in prison for smoking dope. We blame, you know, the guy, that, but we don't look at the entire system that's fucking broken as shit and blame them. Right. Those are the people that hold power. That guy doesn't hold any power. He may not be a great guy. He has no power. Um, it, it's right. really funny. We're so conditioned to admire these people and, re- and that you have to respect this office and respect that and respect the troops, not which actually I know a lot of soldiers that I do respect that are veterans, but it, it's, it's this whole narrative that they give us. And if you don't respect this, then you're a horrible person. Um, and I just reject that. Like, fuck you. Um, I'm not going to respect the government if they're sending people over to get their limbs blown off. And they're literally supporting a government, which we're circling back to this now, that is block helping blockade a country where children are dying of diarrhea. And we have every power within our government to stop that. That's so freaking sick. And you know what's really funny? I, I raise money for Save the Children. Do you know who serves on the board of Save the Children? Joe yeah. fucking Biden. Uh, How well, ironic figures. is that? Yeah. How ironic. Yep. Well, you know like, what? It's probably a smart move on their part. Oh, oh, of course, you know, um, right. but this guy votes and, um, he's a, he's a neocon that maybe is like anti-abortion. He's the same thing as them. He's the worst. He's just an establishment person and he's really creepy, but, um, you know, you can be on the board of these, like the Clintons are on so many like, uh, charity boards, but yet they'll vote and, um, support these regimes, which are oppressing these children. And I just, I think, my God, how does nobody see this? Like there, I, and I just read, I think it was from antiwar.com. I think by the end of 2019, we were going to surpass uh, 230,000 civilian deaths in Yemen through disease, cholera, you know, all that because of the blockade, 230,000 people. And these I'd motherfuckers are going I, yeah, I don't know that that was the number that's reported. I think it's higher than that. Numbers are difficult because like you have direct impact and indirect impact. I, I think you probably right. know a little bit more about that. So yeah. as to what's going on in Yemen, give us a little bit of more of a backstory. Yeah. Or just well, tell well, us like the narrative. Quick, let me just address uh, real quick what you're saying about, you know, killing the kids and whatever you say, you have a lot of right wingers in your audience. So, you know, I would just mm-hmm. say to them that, I know that they're, they reach back to premise one, which is they started it. The bad guys started it. The terrorists started it. We're defending ourselves. It's their insane religion that makes them like this. So there's no way you can reason with them. And so we have to just kill them. But that's just not true. Okay. So just forget Reagan and the Bushes for a second and just say, it was Carter, and then Carter got reelected, and then it was Mondale, and then it was Bill Clinton, and then it was Hillary, and then it was Barack Obama, and it's been Democrats this whole time. Now, can you examine it and look at it and go, yeah, in Carter's second term, <laughs> Reagan's first term, he really doubled down on support for the terrorists in Afghanistan and on support for Saddam Hussein in his massive war against Iran. And that, yeah, and then it was, uh, you know, Mondale's second term there, <laughs> Bush Sr.'s first term, when we went to war in Iraq <laughs> and occupied the Saudi desert and killed you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of people and then stayed and pretended that Saddam wasn't disarmed yet and pretended that he was going to massacre every last one of his own people if we didn't wage these no-fly zones from bases on the Holy Arabian Peninsula for the entire decade long of Bill Clinton, Mondale, and then Bill Clinton all through the 1990s. This is what caused Al-Qaeda to attack us. It's not because they think that mm-hmm. Mohammed said, kill every pretty white girl. <laughs> no. We hear that she believes in Jesus, but not Mohammed. They don't care about right. that. They were never motivated about that. They didn't even know that. about us until we were there. <laughs> 
Yeah, you're going to wear a mini skirt to go vote in a primary election, and that's what drives them to cross the sea and commit suicide, to crash, to hijack a plane and crash it into your building. It's not about that. It's about the aggression of the American empire. And, you know, um, yeah, they admitted this stuff, right? Like, this is not a secret. Paul Wolfowitz said, this is why we have to invade Iraq, so we can get our troops out of Saudi Arabia, where they serve as Osama bin Laden's number one reason for attack in the United States. Colin Powell said, now's your chance, George Bush. Now's the chance to force the Israelis to get the hell out of the West Bank so that the Palestinians can have it for their independent Palestinian state. Because refusing to do so and allowing the Israelis to continue to colonize and occupy these people is one of the greatest drivers of anti-American terrorism in the world. We mm -hmm. have to solve mm -hmm. this. That was Powell who said that. You know, it was Anthony Zinni. Well, I guess he might have been a Democrat, but he was a four star general. Um, all of these guys, they admitted this was so. Again, Paul Wolfowitz said this is a reason to invade Iraq and kill a bunch of Iraqis and put bases in their country because now nah, the Muslims won't mind that. They just mind the bases being in Saudi Arabia. But at least he admitted that part of it. And so. In other words, Jimmy Carter started this, and every president since then has made it worse. They backed al-Qaeda, they backed Saddam, then they attacked Saddam and pissed off al-Qaeda. And then when al-Qaeda attacked, they took the excuse to go back to Iraq, and then from there to Yemen, to Libya, to Syria, to overthrow these secular dictators who were enemies of Israel, mm -hmm. but not really enemies of the United States, and certainly not uh, partners with Osama bin Laden, Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi. Muammar Gaddafi is the first person who put out an Interpol warrant for Osama bin Laden. You know, we can talk about Salah. Salah was friends with the Muslim Brotherhood, but he wasn't uh, friends with Al Qaeda. He was letting Osama, uh, he was letting Obama kill Al Qaeda guys in Yemen. There, and we did a regime change against him in 2012. Then the same thing with Bashar al-Assad, who's an Alawite and he wears a three-piece suit and shaves his chin every morning. And our government <laughs> takes the side of Al Qaeda guys against him because he's friends with Iran. That did not attack mm -hmm. us. You know, it's nuts. What? has gone on it's not just how you look at how horrible it is what carter and reagan and bush and clinton did to get us into this mess what bush and obama have done since then is just about unbelievable you know mm -hmm. and donald trump i'm not giving him a pass it's just he's continued on everything that he inherited he hasn't stopped a single one he gets no credit well he gets a little credit for trying to get us out of afghanistan but that ain't done yet yeah but, but he he folded he folds yeah, but I mean, Obama launched these regime changes. I mean, this mm -hmm. stuff is on him, Yemen, Libya, Syria. So um, that's the narrative. And that's, you know what? Like, I don't care if you're in love with Ronald Reagan. He still, he backed Saddam mm -hmm. for eight years against Iran. Mm -hmm. And he backed the Arab Afghan army that went to go and help the Afghan Mujahideen fight against the Soviets. And then it was his successor, Bush Sr., who betrayed these guys, who essentially stabbed them in the back and made them into our enemies. Bill Clinton only twisted the knife and made it worse. Remember in 1996, there was a massive bombing in Saudi Arabia at the Kobar Towers barracks. 19 American airmen were killed. And uh, the biggest news about it was that some lady yelled at Bill Clinton, you suck, and he, because of the lack of security there, and which was a good point, um, and so <laughs> he had her arrested. He had her detained for two days by the Secret Service, which was just goes to show you what scum that guy was. But anyway, that got all the headlines. And the reason it didn't really make much of an impression on people was because they blamed it on Iran. But it wasn't Iran. It was Osama bin Laden and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed that did it. If Iran did it, well, then it was just kind of what, like a weird target of opportunity across the Gulf in Saudi? Mm -hmm. And why would they do it? And there wasn't really a clear reason, and there was, certainly was no attack on Tehran in retaliation. And so they, they falsely accused somebody of it and then let it go away, and nothing happened anyway. But the opposite story is what if they told the truth? And what if they had reckoned with the American people that there's some right wing religious Saudis who want us the hell off of their land? It's not a coincidence. It's not just a kind of weird target of opportunity across the Gulf like the Iranians. It's very meaningful that these guys truck bombed a barracks full of American airmen 
whose job it was to fly sorties over Iraq from these bases. White American Christian combat forces on the Arabian Holy Peninsula, land of Mecca and Medina, where they're waging a blockade and a no-fly zone campaign for Bill Clinton's entire eight years long, two years of George Bush before that, 10 years straight. This was what Bill, oh, what uh, Ron Paul said in the, the famous Giuliani moment. He said, come on, mm -hmm. we were bombing Iraq for 10 years before mm -hmm. they attacked us on September 11th. He could have and should have said, from bases in Saudi. And that is mm -hmm. why they attacked us. So, yes, it's true that they are, Bin Laden and his men are Islamic and Islamist extremists, as in they want a regime of Islamist law and this kind of thing. That is who they are, but that is not right. why they do what they do, what they, no, or I, why Scott, they target us. If I could interrupt you, because I think that's a really important point, and I, I find that when I'm having a discussion and intercourse with people that maybe are like a conservatarians or whatever. Um, there's this idea that if someone is bad on the other side of the world, we have the impetus to act against it when they don't understand that a lot of times the person that's bad, yes, they're not a good person, but the reason they're acting against us is because of our actions. Um, just because somebody's not a great person doesn't mean that we we have the impetus to act against them or aggress against them. I think it's a really weird American ideal. Like we have some sort of moral uh, impetus to, you know, act in the world for, on behalf of people, which is also something that the media like, you know, with you look at like Assad. Oh, he's gassing people. Well, we're the good guys. We need to go in, which is all a false narrative. But um, it, it's very strange that I think in the American idea, which is perpetuated by the media, that uh, these people are so bad and we're going to be the good guys and go in. Number one, most of the time we have um, bad intentions going in. Number two, just because somebody's bad doesn't mean somebody worse can't replace them. Um, I, I think that's, it's, it's a it's a very American idea. Right. Well, and you know what it is, is there's all this footage of America liberating France from the Nazis. And <laughs> yes. so and the lesson of that is America is Superman and what America does mm -hmm. is always moral. And what America does is always for truth, justice, and the American way, as Superman would have said. And our enemies are always the Nazis, irrational, pure, mechanized mm -hmm. evil that cannot be dealt with, only destroyed right. with demands of unconditional surrender and all of these kinds of things. And then that becomes a template. Right, and Captain you know, American thing, will swoop in. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I read this thing. It was kind of some pretentious left-wing garbage, but actually it was like really insightful about how in the 1990s with Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers, and then mm -hmm. I forgot the one in the Pacific, the, the big red one and whatever. They had all of these different like – really spectacular World War II movies and the HBO miniseries there, the Band of Brothers and all this. And it really had people feeling like, and you know, the neocons wrote about this stuff that like, yeah, see, that's what we need is a big, important crusade that we can all believe mm -hmm. in together. We can all do together for our national greatness. This is what makes America great is not the pursuit of the optimum, you know, the ultimate amount of liberty for every right. person. But we've lost the, the pursuit of entrepreneurship and helping our neighbors through voluntary right. association. Instead, and it's all foreign crusades. That. Right now, mm -hmm. it's always liberating this country and liberating that country. Um, <laughs> How when, freaking ironic fact, is that? Yeah, and you know what? You only have to be a tiny little bit cynical to see that we're the British Empire now. This is mm -hmm. not all so magnanimous like that time we saved France from the Nazis. And even then, a lot of French you on people that. died. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's good. <laughs> I just actually learned a thing recently about the tens of thousands of French who were killed by the Americans on D-Day. Just leveled their towns and just all oh, it's that that was the people we were saving. I had no then, idea about that, the Scott. Worst occupation, right? <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so that's the problem is um, people, they don't want to ask the question. I get this about Iran all the time now, too. But didn't Iran blow up the Marine Corps barracks in Beirut in 1983? And then I go, yeah, but then Ronald Reagan sold the missiles a year after that to use against Saddam, who he was also arming. So, and by the way, the Israelis, after the Iranian revolution and the rise of the Ayatollah and Shiite radical Islam in Iran, 
the Israelis kept their relationship with Iran until like 1994, when they finally decided for strategic purposes to tilt toward the Arabs and against the periphery, which had nothing to do with anything Iran had done and everything to, or who they were and everything to do with just Israel's strategy for dealing with the Palestinians. Their near problem, not their far away problem. Um, and so, you know, and, you know, no offense against the Marines, but they are Marines. They are military men targets. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, catching them with a truck bomb in their sleep is kind of, you know, sneaky and underhanded. But then again, Ronald Reagan was just shelling neighborhoods of Beirut from the battleship mm -hmm. New Jersey for weeks and killing innocent people, provoking that attack and accomplishing nothing. And Ronald Reagan, after those Marines were killed, he said, what the hell did I put the Marines in Lebanon for? And he got them out immediately. He pulled the rest out. And then he wrote in his diary, he should have never done that. Um, that. There was no strategic purpose in putting them in there at all and this and that. Now, did the Iranians and Hezbollah and, or the Amal militia really that did that bombing, did they have important strategic and tactical reasons for doing that? Yeah, they needed the Americans out. And it was... It was do or die for them. It was everything to them. It was nothing to us. Why were we even there at mm -hmm. all? And so, um, you know, that's not to excuse it, but it's to add the proper context that we're talking about almost 40 years ago, 35 years ago, a, an Iranian proxy militia bombed an American military target. That is not good enough of an excuse for America to still hate Iran and to do, you know, to criticize them and persecute them and refuse to engage in a real rapprochement with them. There's no reason in the world why Donald Trump can go on TV tomorrow and say, listen, you and you, I'm not afraid of no Ayatollah. I'm going to Tehran. I'm going to make friends with this son of a bitch and we're going to work things out because I say so. He's the leader of the most powerful nation in the world times 100. He could do that just like he's doing with Korea if he wanted to so, do it. To he that could. point, Scott, so what would in your, okay, Scott Horton can whisper in the president's ear and he can make him declare anything and sign anything. What would mm -hmm. you have him do tomorrow? First thing would be to invite Putin to Washington, D.C. to sign a massive nuclear arms reduction treaty. And then he should get right up in the microphone and say, hey, Democrats, suck it. If you don't like <laughs> it, you, you go tell your constituents why you're against this nuclear arms reduction pact. And I don't even care if the Senate ratifies it. I'm ordering the dismantlement of these bombs. That's what I would tell them to do. That's the only issue in the world that really matters. Second and third would so? be to get the hell out of Yemen and get the hell out of mm -hmm. Somalia, Afghanistan, so and the rest yeah. of those. Yeah. Yes. But Russia's first, because that's the one where if a general nuclear war with Russia broke out, it would be the end of at least all northern hemisphere human civilization for, you know, a thousand years. And and maybe everybody, certainly billions mm -hmm. of people would die from not just the attacks on the cities, but from the fires and the nuclear winter. So what happens is you have these cities and these forest fires, these massive fires, all that soot goes up above the clouds into the stratosphere where the rain can't rain it down and get it out of the sky. And so it takes, it could take decades for that soot to filter back down to the ground and for sunlight to get through. So you would just have massive crop failures all across the entire planet for global destruction. You know, years and years and years and years, billions of people yeah. would die. So there's really, in the scheme of things that matter, nothing matters other than the relationship between the United States of America and Russia mm. and that we keep it on an even keel. And seriously, if the Democrats don't like it, they should go and drown themselves. I would agree. I would quite agree. Well, they can drown themselves and then say woe to the media and be fancy yeah, like seriously. that. So, but yeah, you know what? So here's, yeah. Check out, we're going to get to Yemen in just okay. one second, but check out this whole phony yeah. construct that after the Soviet Union, the USSR that dominated not just Russia, but all of Eastern Europe, all the way halfway through Germany, all of Southern Asia, it just absolutely vanished, disappeared off the face of the earth. And then what do the American policymakers do? They went, oh, do no. one of these when this little bitty thing no. comes back up. <laughs> yeah, well, that too. But but they said, what we got to do, we got to figure out how are we going to deal with these rogue powers of Iran, Iraq and <laughs> North Korea? Right. Well, yeah, we were just able to wait like out it. the USSR. <laughs> But North Korea now, we don't know what we're going to do.
And the thing is, that this is all just a me. fake excuse, right? <laughs> Same thing with the rock. It's a fake excuse to keep the Pentagon mm-hmm. in business, to keep the military the departments going, to keep their contractors keep going, going. Mm-hmm. and all those interests, those special interests, as uh, mm-hmm. Ross Perot used to say, um, that. You know, and this is something that's very kind of libertarian and, and certainly very capitalist um, and, and should be, you know, interesting for conservatives if they're not familiar, is public choice theory, which explores the irrationality of democratic politics and the way people vote against their interests um, or, or support positions that are against their own interest. Um you know, for various, essentially, as Obi-Wan Kenobi would say, the economics of politics and why everything is so screwed up, all the disincentives to doing the right thing and all the incentives to keep doing the wrong thing and, Mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and you just see that in, in spades in the military, there's no reason in the world to think that the military is exempt from those exact same kind of economics. And they're getting paid with tax money. In other words, they don't have to earn it. It's not their (laughs) money. So all they want is as much as they can get. And every threat is as big as they can make it seem to be. And they have no Mm -hmm. interest in saying that it's actually not a dangerous world out there. We're Mm -hmm. actually allies with every power in Europe. We're friends with every power in Europe. We're friends with China, our second biggest trading partner. There are no other powers in the Americas to deal with whatsoever. There are no powers in Africa at all. India could be a power in like 75 years from now. And they certainly don't have any, you know, expansionist imperial policies. And now Mm -hmm. we're out. You flip through the whole globe. We're out of enemies. There's nobody left. They got to pretend to be afraid of the Ayatollah. It's a joke. It's a lie. But if they don't have their straw man and their villain, then how do they keep the war machine going? And it's so funny. We're we're such a large nation of people. We have all this, you know, internet and, and alternative media, and we still believe the mainstream idea. It's, and I right. hope that the crowd of people not buying into it is growing because that's the only way to change it, you know, well, you know the if military they don't have the consent the of the government. Yeah, government. the military itself calls it a self-licking ice cream cone. That's their, that's their term for when you start a project and then you just keep on the dang thing and you can't give it up. I mean, look at the F-35. <laughs> they want trillions of dollars on this F-35. It's a total piece of garbage. It can't fight. It's not fast. It's not stealthy. It can't carry, you know, hardly any weapons. The software doesn't work. The helmet doesn't work. If you try to eject, it'll at least break your neck, if not decapitate you. Um, The thing falls right out of the sky. You know, they bombed a drug lab in Afghanistan. And they went, all right, F-35 does its debut ground attack where they're just killing innocent civilians at their home. And then... But they stopped trumpeting it an hour or two later. You know why? Because another F-35 fell right out of the sky in North Carolina. And they went, oh, let's not talk about F-35s anymore today. Another one just fell out of the sky in Japan last week. Um, It's a total lemon. It's a total piece of garbage. The F-16 can beat the crap out of it. The F-16 that was designed in 1972 can can beat the crap out of the F-35 every single time. Even loaded down with extra bombs and fuel tanks to give it a disadvantage. The F-16 still wins. And they spent... You know, they claim only a trillion and a half dollars on this thing so far, and they'll never give it up. And, oh, t- you know, the stealth t- doesn't even work. A trillion and a half stealthy. dollars? Dear God. Yeah. That's just to start. <laughs> and they just announced, you know, Obama signed a bill. In fact, Obama wanted to get a nuclear reduction treaty with Russia through. Uh, this is back when that would have been a good thing to do, not high treason, right? And Obama wanted, it's called Start Two. But in order to get it through the Senate, he had to give all these concessions to the nuclear weapons lobby. And they actually have a nuclear weapons caucus in the Congress where they don't even know that they should <laughs> be embarrassed to say. I had that no they idea, Scott. The that's arms. the worst thing I've ever heard. <laughs> I swear, I'm telling you. They don't even know that that's embarrassing. They're like, we're here to sell you some H-bombs. And, and what's the ceiling on how many H-bombs the USA needs? There is no ceiling, you know. <laughs> and so Obama signed this thing. For a trillion dollar new program to not just completely revamp from the ground up America's nuclear arsenal, but our entire nuclear weapons industry. Honeywell gets all new factories. Wait. So basically, you've just informed me that the United States government is in a 
nuclear pyramid scheme. It's a nuclear pyramid scheme, basically. That's what we're exactly. doing. And you know we're selling it to Congress. Me, you, might, you might think of like the AARP and the NRA and even the Israelis <laughs> and even the helicopter and the military jet lobbies and go, yeah, of course, all these special interests, big pharma and agriculture and banking, they right, all right, have right. their interests. But it mm-hmm. might not occur to you that the guys that make the hydrogen bombs are no different they hire lobbyists to protect their interest, mm-hmm. to push for their interest, to lobby for more H bombs, to lobby for strategies that require more H bombs. And they're no mm-hmm. different than any other interest group in this country, other than nobody yeah. pays any attention to them. And nobody, there's no, like the only way to counteract them, right, would be for all of society to just shame them into silence. When we need an H bomb from you, we'll ask for one. Until then, shut up. If right, but if <laughs> if society doesn't treat them that way, then they're brave as hell, man. There's one on Capitol Hill right now with a briefcase full of money, taking a senator out to a state dinner, and that's all it costs for get a trillion dollars worth of nukes. And now that it's Trump. They're already, and of course, you saw this coming. They're already saying, oh, that $1 trillion nuclear weapons plan over 10 years? Yeah, it's now 1.7. And you know it'll be three or four by the time they're done. Oh, and yes. why? To remake oh, yes. a bunch of H-bombs they've already got. Yeah. You know, they oh, have no, the ability it's, it's, to put, <laughs> you know, miniaturized yeah, they'll nukes sell on you, They'll head. sell you a bill just like a shitty contractor will. That's going to mm-hmm. build a deck on your house, say it's $20,000, right. and at the end of the day, he has so many problems, and it's fifty. But it's not his fault. Problems That's right. came it's up. Just, <laughs> it's like Medicare yeah. fraud, only for H-bombs. You know, same yeah. deal, different day. Should we talk That's, about Yemen? You know, I should about Yemen, right? Yes, we should, too, because, well, I generally go about an hour and a half, and we're coming close to on a live, because we'll get really good engagement. Um, so okay. Yemen... Uh, there's a war there. There's a blockade on the country. Children are dying. Literally, they're shitting themselves and dying. Um, yep. What is the U.S. role in that? And fill these people in because I, I have some working knowledge of it. But if you could give us like the play by play of what's going on. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's all America's fault, of course. So 2009, Obama's. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, everybody picture, you know, Yemen. Yeah, we're talking about the southwest corner of the Arabian Peninsula. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of a, it's a long rectangle this way. Um, but about the entire eastern half of the country is nothing but desert. So we're talking essentially about the western half of the country and then you know, south, middle, and north, okay, is the the breakdown geographically here of what's of interest. Okay, so Mm -hmm. 2009, Obama orders the CIA and JSOC to start killing al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula guys there with drones. He gives um, uh, Abdullah Saleh, the dictator, who had come to power in 91 and had been supported by the U.S. ever since then, they gave Saleh money and guns as payment to let us bomb al-Qaeda. So as the CIA is bombing al-Qaeda, they're just killing innocent people. You know, believe it or not, a 500 pound bomb dropped from a drone is actually not a scalpel. It's a 500 pound bomb. So compared to marching the third infantry division into Iraq or something, then I guess it's a scalpel. But in reality, they were killing innocent people. And so the whole thing was backfiring. In fact, that one famous case, there was a tribal chief who went to meet the leaders of Al-Qaeda and tell them, you better stay the hell out of my area or me and my guys are going to kill you guys. And the CIA bombed that meeting where the tribal chief was telling them to go to hell and killed the tribal chief and the Al-Qaeda guys too. And then the Al-Qaeda guys came into town and took over the town. So that, just like with anything, these guys, they think they know what they're doing. They're too clever by half. This is when they're targeting Al-Qaeda. This is not when they're fighting for them. This is when they're targeting Al-Qaeda. They just make them stronger. It's just like pouring water on plants. Mm-hmm. They just mm-hmm. more. Okay. At the same time, Abdullah Saleh is taking the money and guns that Obama gave him and is using some guys from the Al-Islah party, which is the Yemeni Muslim Brotherhood. And he's using them and his military to attack the Houthis in the north. Now, they are Zaydi Shia, which means that essentially they're like kind of halfway between Sunni and Shia. And they're not 12ers like the Iranians who believe the hidden 12th Imam will come back at the end of the world or whatever. They have a different set of beliefs. They're much more like Sunnis, in fact. Um, But that's, you know, their distinction. And Houthi is a political designation named after, what's his name, Al-Houthi, from back, uh, who helped defend them from Egyptian attack in the 1960s. 
I'm pretty sure. So that was where the name of the group comes from. So they're Zaidi, Shia, and they're Houthis. That's their political designation. And Salah attacked them over and over again, six times. They won every time. They drove his forces back. And just like with the CIA war against Al-Qaeda in the South, Salah's wars against the Houthis in the North just made them more and more powerful. Then the Arab Spring breaks out. Tunisia, Mm -hmm. Egypt, and then the whole Middle East erupts in days of rage, protests, and all these things. So at that point, virtually everyone in Yemeni society agreed it's time to get rid of Saleh. Wanted him gone, and that included the Houthis, but they had massive uh, protests at the uh, you know town square like they had had in Egypt and all that kind of stuff. And then somebody tried to kill him. There's two different assassination attempts with bombs. And the second one got him, but didn't kill him. But so he was wounded and at home. And so while he was wounded and like down and out of power, Hillary Clinton swooped in and with the Saudis kicked him out and put full support behind his vice president, a guy named Abdul Mansur Hadi. The problem with Hadi was um, that, uh, you know, he was like Dan Quayle to Bush senior or whatever. He didn't have what Salah had in terms of charisma or support from the different tribal factions that Salah had, you know, balanced all those years. And so Hadi was just really clumsy. He had no real major base of support inside the country, just the Americans and the Saudis, which really made him look worse. And then what he did was he attacked the Houthis. And just like when Salah did it, it backfired and only made them more and more powerful as they fought off his divisions and, you know, attacked back. Then he also tried to institute a strong federalism program where essentially they have these kind of loose provinces and he was going to try to take a black magic marker and make them hard state borders in a way that would have essentially cut the Houthis off from the Red Sea. So they can't fish, they can't Mm -hmm. trade, they can't do Mm -hmm. anything. So this is a huge provocation. And so the Houthis marched on Sana. And at the end of 2014, beginning of 2015, they took it over. And I already knew this because I had a couple sources that told me this. Um, But then I went back and I actually found this footnote from the Wall Street Journal from January of 2015, where they say that CENTCOM was working with the Houthis to target Al-Qaeda. It was just two months later that Obama switched sides in the war and took the side Mm -hmm. of the Saudis and Al-Qaeda against the Houthis. And so the reason for that is it's kind of a complicated mess, but essentially this is as in the spring of 2015, this is right in the lead up to signing the nuclear deal with Iran. And, um, So as part of that, the Saudis essentially now, so there's an ironic thing here. Okay. If the Saudis concern was that the Iranians were going to make nuclear bombs, then you would think that they would support the deal because what the deal did was it really locked down Iran's nuclear program, their civilian nuclear program to great degrees. It scaled back their production. They poured concrete into their heavy water reactor that was capable of producing plutonium. Um, and they expanded their inspection regime. So it was a dream come true for nonproliferation. But that's not what the Saudis were worried about, because guess what? That was a big fake threat in the first place. They never were making nukes in the first place. It was all a lie. But what Obama was trying to do was take that most important excuse for war with Iran off the table Mm -hmm. by saying, well, you know, if the NPT ain't good enough and the safeguards agreement ain't good enough, we're going to lock their program down double, extra, triple so that the Israelis, nobody will be able to pretend that it's still a nuclear weapons threat, which worked. OK, but so the Saudis flipped out because the Saudis were worried that this meant that Obama wanted to start tilting back toward Iran and wanted to change America's overall grand strategy for dominance in the Middle East. And instead of being in first place, they might have to share first place or get demoted because of course, America had a long time relationship with Iran from the early fifties through the late seventies. They're a very important nation. And so the Saudis were worried about that. And so as Obama told the New York Times, him and his people, this was no scoop. This was like 17 official sources talked to the New York Times. And what they said was, I swear you find this, Google the exact words. They knew that the war would be long, bloody, and indeterminate. 
indeterminate. Oh, Jesus. I mean, they did oh, not God. have even an idea for what the end mm-hmm. of the war would look like. If you had told them, yeah, what we're going to do is put Hadi back on the throne, they knew then that that was not going to happen. It would be long, bloody, and indeterminate, but we're going to start it anyway because mm-hmm. we have to, quote, placate the Saudis after the Iran nuclear deal. And then, so back to public choice theory here. In comes the new deputy crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman. He was the one who launched the war. He was 29 years old, brand new on the job as defense minister and deputy crown prince. And he launched this war for his own political fortunes inside the Saudi kingdom. And it did help him. It did make him, you know, big macho war leader who then was able to move against the previous crown prince, his cousin, Bin Nayef, and replace him as crown prince and move up in Saudi politics. You know, good old uh, Mohammed uh, Bonesaw um, Bin Salman there. And so that was who Obama was placating when he meant placate the Saudi. When he said placate the Saudis, he was saying, let's, we have to placate this 29 year old would be war criminal because of his own political ambitions inside this monarchy, this absolute monarchy that we are tied at the hip to. And so we have to do what he says. And so that was why they launched this war. And the UAE has ground forces, mostly mercenaries Mm -hmm. and including Al Qaeda forces are, you know, in terms of ground troops, they are a major part of the military force of the, what they call the Saudi led coalition, which is in fact the USA led coalition. So it's basically our country supporting them through um, helping the Saudis, but we're actually don't don't we arm them and then don't we have like i think there's naval bases that we support them through as well in this conflict yeah, so, uh-huh so they get all of their planes and all of their bombs and everything from us everything and you know trump has tried to mm-hmm. say well you know if we don't support them in this war that he owns now it's been two years mm-hmm. more than two years if we don't support them support them in this war they could turn around and start buying all their weapons from russia and china instead well, that's just not true oh, no russia and china and weapons <laughs> Yeah, like, first of all, who cares? And even if you're an imperialist, yeah, even if you're an imperialist, we're still only talking about a couple of $10 billion. So it's not like it's a major mm-hmm. part of the American economy or anything. It's no, essentially yeah, we own the weapons countries. economy. We have a corner on yeah. that market. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah, And the Saudis are wholly dependent on American weaponry. Um, mm-hmm. If they wanted to switch to Russia, they would essentially have to throw out everything we've sold them all these years and switch right. over to a whole new integrated system. And that was never going to happen anyway. That's such a fake threat anyway. Um, and then, so, so yes, it is American, American planes, mm-hmm. primarily F-15s um, and American spies and contractors and military men helping with the targeting, helping with the intelligence collection. And, of course, the U.S. Navy is helping to enforce the blockade against Mm -hmm. civilian commercial uh, Mm -hmm. food traffic and the rest of it this whole time. And um, And something like 80,000. What would it take, Scott, for us to cease this? Would it take one executive order for us to stop? Donald Trump could speak out loud and say, I want this over now. And that Mm -hmm. would be it. He doesn't even have to lift a pen. All he has to say is this is over. He's the boss. Simple as that. And not, there's not mm-hmm. a general in the entire command who's going to say, no, they're going to do exactly what he says if he's firm. Right. And they'll try to find a way to w- wiggle out of it, maybe. But oh, if he's sure, firm, yeah. they'll do what he says. They, they will do what he says. And so it's all on him. He owns this thing 100%. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so, um, so it's been four years now. This is the poorest country in the Middle East. They barely have any oil. And you won't be surprised to learn that because of previous IMF and World Bank gangsterism, they had been essentially persuaded to abandon all of their local domestic food crops like sorghum and replace Mm -hmm. it all with coffee and other crops that they could sell on the global market. Because the idea was, hey, you can make more money selling coffee and then you can buy all kinds of different food and stop just eating sorghum all the damn time. Or whatever. So welcome to global capitalism. It's great until we put you yeah. under a full scale imperial blockade under our star right. destroyers in your orbit. And you now can't even screwed, have a freaking hospital you know? or fresh water. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So and I want to so- go to that point, be- um, Scott, and I hate to interrupt you because I'm 
when you talk, it's like you're telling me a narrative and a story, which is what I really enjoy about you because it's much more relational than just reading a random news story, but apparently it's draining the hell out of my phone. <laughs> so, um, the crisis in Yemen, obviously there's a blockade. We've talked about the U S um, backing <laughs> essentially Al Qaeda, but, uh, the Saudis in, in a war that we have no right to be in. And then you've talked about the beginnings of it. Um, I do want to highlight, uh, there are very few charities, uh, that are able to get in there, obviously because of the blockade, and they have to be UN blocked chair or uh, backed charities, which I'm not a huge fan of, but they're doing some good. So I'm going to link it when I do put this live, and I'll go on several channels. Um, Save the Children slash, slash Yemen has been there since 1968, and they do good work. Uh, mobile health units. Uh, there's, you know, obviously children are being bombed and by U.S. bombs, but a lot of them are just dying because they have no access to clean water, um, medicine for very treatable diseases. Um, so I want to America, really look, encourage American people Saudi, to learn. Let me say real quick here that American yeah. Saudi are deliberately bombing their waterworks, deliberately bombing yes. their sewage, oh, yes. deliberately bombing their electricity, and even bombing their farms, bombing their irrigation ditches, bombing flocks of sheep out in the field, bombing grain silos, doing everything That's they so can, bombing cholera hospitals, but doing everything they can to bomb the very basics of the food distribution system in the country. I mean, it's, it is a medieval genocidal campaign, a deliberate starvation That's... campaign against the civilian population. Mm -hmm. That's almost worse than Vietnam in that fact, honestly, if you think about that. And not that you know the scale of it is probably less right now, who knows what it'll be but you know um they're not hurting the political class there or you know rebels or anything like that they're hurting the people that just want to live they're hurting the mother that wants to give birth to a child and she can't like <laughs> go to a hospital and be safe they're hurting the mother that's breastfeeding and she's starving and she can't that's who they're hurting and that's the government that we live under so um I, I just i don't think a lot of people are aware of it and it's very frustrating and i can wax poetic and i could say fuck the state all day and i could be angry but part of the reason why i want to give people information number one information is always power but also we can do something i do think save the children does some good you know even if it's a small amount and whatever they can get to these people, they can get to them. So I really want to encourage people to go there. I'm going to do that in the comments. Um, I'm so running out of power. I could talk to you like five hours, Scott. <laughs> You're awesome. awesome. Hey, uh, you know, doctors out borders is really great with you too. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so link some of that to me too, because we're going to air this live tomorrow. Um, obviously not the video, but I'm going to do a live where I can interact. Um, so mm -hmm. they do great work. Obviously, these kids can be they're savable. Um, you know. Having diarrhea is a pretty, pretty easy fix if they had access right. to really just not modern medicine, just, <laughs> just medicine. Um, and the fact that our yeah, government let me is, is, yeah, let, let me mention here, too, that there's it, this sounds crazy and unbelievable, but it's really true. Both houses of Congress invoked the war powers resolution. And they, they went back and, and forth a couple of times. They passed identical versions. They passed it to Trump. He vetoed it. And now Sanders yeah. and others in the Senate are trying to mount an effort to override the veto on the war powers resolution and force an mm -hmm. end of this war. Again, it's a war for Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula there that has empowered them beyond bin Laden's wildest dreams there in oh, the south yeah. of that you, country. People and go so to antiwar.com because all those what t Scott's talking about, I read a lot of those articles are there. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, that's why I said I I. I laugh when joe biden says he's running he serves on the board of save the children which yeah. i think it has some issues he but it's a good organization he was the vice president i know he was the vice it's president like, let me kill your kids and then try to get him a few dollars yeah <laughs> right. fuck you joe biden fuck you seriously I'm sorry. <laughs> anyways no, um, I'm, I'm going to wrap this speed up I, thank you so much scott you're um I, again kason's gonna link all this stuff in the show notes you're such a uh, wealth of knowledge and i'm so happy that you're a free thinker um, and you're on our side, the peace side and the anti-war side. So I am going to close this out by saying what I normally say at the end, peace and grace to my lovelies that follow me and fuck the state.